these are all the little things we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about the sections of a formal agreement. And then we're going to, you know, get back into our contract concepts and try to fold all these things in together. Hopefully, I'll do a good job of not confusing anybody. And then if you want to, at some point throughout, I might have some questions sometimes. You all haven't been so shy, so I don't think you have to use this that much in this class. Sometimes I have students, they don't want to answer the question. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about, and you'll see now, see, I have synthesized my slides a little bit more, okay, so that I can try to get my arms around some of the questions that I have been receiving. Okay, so I want to try to uh, talk about everything together and show you some examples and see if we can figure this whole thing out. And so what we're going to be doing, you know, not necessarily will we use all of these particular sections in uh, transaction one, but this is the format that we want to use more or less for this class for our transaction. Transaction one, two, and three. We're going to use, you know, most of these for transaction one, uh, but we're trying to get down these formal, these what we these ten sections of a formal agreement, and we're going to talk about those uh, today. And then see how. So we got a whole lot of things. We got sections, and we got concepts, and we got uh, issues. You gotta bring all that together. You gotta synthesize it. And so as we go along, we're gonna look at our sections and then we're gonna try to see how our concepts, because the concepts are not the sections. Some of them kind of have some of the same names and so it can be kind of confusing. Some parts of some, uh, you have your uh, conditions for closing. Those are not concept conditions, that's something different. That's a section, okay? So we got to synthesize all this out, and then you got to look at the concept that you're going to put in there into your section. Then you want to stand back at that thing, and then you want to look at it and say, okay, do I have any issues of client concern within this provision that I just wrote into this section, this particular section? Does, are there any money, risk, control, standards issues? That, this, that's how I would do it. That's, that's what I'm saying. And so that's what I want to do as we go along. Uh, we want to keep all of these ideas in mind as we go along. And so the first thing I want to talk about is the introductory provisions. Okay. And so this is the place where, you know, you're just kind of like, just introducing, this is like, you just don't want to start off with the agreement to start with the definitions. You want to lay the foundation. You want the name of the agreement. You want to identify the parties. This agreement is entered into on such such date. The date. You want to give the subject matter, give a little outline of the purpose of the agreement. And then uh, our book also talks about there are some words of agreement me personally, I would like to use in an agreement if I'm going to do that. If I'm going to have an agreement, what's the point? I want to make sure that all has all the bells and whistles. And so the book it suggests that you have the words of agreement. I want to see those words of agreement. Uh, what, and the, what the book also calls a statement of consideration, which has two parts. A statement of what the consideration is, and then you have these magic words. This agreement provides for the sale uh, to the buyer of the seller's red car. This will be the consideration, what the consideration is in this agreement. And then you have those magic words. The seller and the buyer agree as follows. And so when I look at that introductory provision, you would say, you know, uh, 
is just an introductory provision, you know, so. Just, but you still have to look at that and determine if, you know, you're going to have any covenants in there, any, uh, any of these contract concepts. And then you want to look at it and determine whether or not there are any money, risk, control issues. You want to do this in each one of the sections. That is how I would do it. But it brings about a very interesting contract snafu. And so now these parties that are in this situation here, some people may like one of them, some people may not like that person, some people may like this person, some people may not like either one of them. But we will have to represent people we don't like. I like both of them. I think I just love them. I'm obsessed with both of them. <laughs> Either one of them could walk into my office and I would be like, what can I do with you? <laughs> Adult film actress Stormy Daniels says fear kept her from talking about an alleged affair with President Trump. She told her complete story last night on 60 Minutes. It's already under attack by the lawyer from Michael Cohen, the president's personal attorney. Stormy Daniels says she signed a non-disclosure agreement because... She was worried about her and her family's safety. She claims that Michael Cohen threatened her with financial ruin to keep quiet. The interview presents possible legal challenges for Cohen and Mr. Trump. Major Garrett is at the White House, which has said nothing about the 60-minute story. Major, good morning. Good morning. Daniels discussed in some detail this alleged affair with President Trump. It's one she had previously denied, by the way. She also made mention of an alleged threat against her and her daughter. Now, on the eve of this 60 Minutes broadcast that went into all of this, the president had dinner with his lawyer, Michael Cohen. The two of them, of course, are at the center of this ongoing legal and political drama. I was in a parking lot going to a fitness class with my infant daughter, and a guy walked up on me and said to me, leave Trump alone, forget the story. And then he leaned around and looked at my daughter and said, a, a beautiful little girl would be ashamed if something happened to her mom. And then he was gone. In an interview with 60 Minutes, Stormy Daniels says she was first threatened to stay silent in 2011. You took it as a direct threat. Absolutely. I was rattled. I remember going into the workout class and my hands were shaking so much I was afraid I was going to uh, drop her. Did you go to the police? No. Why? Because I was scared. Daniels says she doesn't know who threatened her. Her lawyer, Michael Avenatti, says a new lawsuit filed by Cohen is meant to intimidate his client. There's no question. You threaten someone uh, with a $20 million lawsuit, it's a thuggish tactic. It's no different than what happened in the parking lot in Las Vegas. Michael Cohen has denied ever threatening Daniels. His lawyer fired back overnight at Avenatti with a cease and desist letter calling allegations she was threatened baseless. Mr. Cohen had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with any such person or incident and does not even believe that any such person exists. Was it hush money to say so? Yes. Um, the story was coming out again. Um, I was concerned for my family and their safety. After signing a non-disclosure agreement, Daniel said she lied in statements where she denied having an affair with Mr. Trump. If it was untruthful, why did you sign it? because they made it sound like I had no choice. Yeah, no one was putting a gun to your head. Not physical violence, no. You thought that there would be some sort of legal repercussion if you didn't sign that? As a matter of fact, the exact sentence used was, they can make your life hell in many different ways. They being? I'm not exactly sure who they were. I believe it to be Michael Cohen. No comment from the White House about all this. An attorney for Mr. Trump referred 60 Minutes to a January signed statement of denial from Daniels, which read in part, my involvement with Donald Trump was limited to a few public appearances and nothing more. Nora? All right, Major, thank you. Okay. So, I'm bringing that email. Film actor. And so here is a copy of the agreement. Um, this is the what we would call, see, there is no right or wrong way, you see. 
uh, you know, they don't necessarily say introductory provisions, but I know that's what it is. We have the parties here. And so you can see, um, I would ask when I read this, because this is some of where our problem will come in that you'll see down the road that I'll talk about a little bit more. Can you all see that? Because I can, okay. By and between EC, LLC, and or David Dennison, DD, on the one part, and Peggy Peterson, PP, on the other part, eventually, this all got kind of convoluted, and nobody knew who, what, when, why, and how. And so you can see here how this can create a standards issue. Yes, ma'am. Wait, I'm confused. So is this the agreement that they have? This, can you, yeah. This oh. is it. So this is Donald Trump, David Dennison. <laughs> David Dennison and Peggy Peterson is Stormy Daniels. <laughs> Get it? And let me just tell you. So everybody, this whole thing, I'm obsessed with it. Right? I'm obsessed with it. Because everybody, you know, and then her lawyer, oh my God, he is just gets on my nerves. But I'm sorry. It, 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 it could have been, it, it was like shabbily done, but who could think to go and, and, and get a corporation, a limited liability corporation, to enter into an agreement for somebody and give them pseudonyms, <laughs> pay somebody off through that company. I mean, it, it was a great idea. I'm sorry. I'm just... <laughs> yes, ma'am. So if they're using pseudonyms, would the signatures be legally binding if they're signing for a different name? Okay, so we're gonna get to we're gonna get to that down in the end. But can you see how mm, that might create a standards issue somewhere? <laughs> standards issue. So here, this is, and we're gonna. I'm I'm not gonna jump the gun. I'm gonna show you down in in the next section where. But this could be, in essence, a, a declaration. Uh, if not. You're going to see, uh, I'm, I am jumping the gun when I say, in the definitions, I would want to drill down on this. Because I need to define who is, who, what, who, who? Because this is how we get loosey-goosey. And then people start flapping and cracking and... <laughs> if I'm going to go through all this trouble... I'm not going to give Stormy Daniels a chance to get on there with Anderson Cooper on 60 Minutes and tell her life story. If this, if my objective is to keep her mouth closed, I'm going to fix her. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. Okay? That's how you have to be for your client. If you're going to, you know, everybody, you know, Donald Trump is a controversial figure. But if he's my client, I'm going to go in for my client. I'm saying to myself, when I get that piece of paper, I'm like, look, Stormy Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you, you have to have a mindset, like, you're going to kill it. <laughs> and so this is all kind of just like, just just, uh, just stuff all over the place. And it, it's a, it was a great idea, though. I, I love the idea. Uh, if I had a chance, I, I probably will use it at some point in the future. So, <laughs> watch out, world. <laughs> and so here we get to our second section. This will take us into our second section when we talk about the definitions. Okay? And uh, last class, I said, say the same thing the same way. Yes, when you have a definition, there can be no question on what this thing means. When I say what's his name? I forget the name. When I say David Dennison, <laughs> once I get that definition, you're going to know who that is. David Dennison, which is a.k.a. Donald Trump, or you know, I don't know how I'm going to do it because the idea here is for confidentiality. Okay, that was the whole point here. And so, but it got kind of loosey-goosey. Because in some places you will see they say EC 
LLC and or David Dennison, but they don't say that all throughout the entire agreement, okay? So that could lead to a standards issue. See, it, once I say EC, LLC, and or David Dennison, it's going to say that everywhere. It got kind of questionable on, okay, because now people are trying to say that, that David Dennison didn't need to sign it. Well, if David Dennison need, didn't need to sign it, then it needs to say everywhere. EC, LLC, and or David Dennison, so that when you say David Dennison, you mean also EC, LLC. part, you're just going to lay things out. So you're not going to have any substantive provisions, your rights, your obligations. They're not going to be in this particular section. And so you'll see these little examples here. These are coming from the uh, car purchase agreement example that you have. You should be reading your transaction one by now. And there are some examples that are in there. And that's where this is coming from. So that is how the definitions look. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about formatting. Because for me, I like for each definition to have a number. So this is the definition 1.0. Then this is going to be 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. I like for them to have numbers. Yes, sir. Like the end game question, can the definitions appear anywhere throughout a contract? They can. Okay. Absolutely. You'll see that. Yes, yes, ma'am. So you want us to start with 1.1, 1 .1, right? Uh, well, if your definition section is, see, I have here Article 1, but it could be that it's Article 2. If it's Article 2, then definition is going to say 2.0. Then you're going to say 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9. What I'm talking about, I can go back and say Article 2.3 in the contract, okay? And so it's still a situation just like, I, you know, even the number one. Uh, can be a standards issue because you you say they said you want to you know you write it out then you want to stand back and look at it and say okay does this create a standards issue I'm looking at that and I'm saying oh what happens if somebody is not clear on on how to identify this definition I go back and I say okay that's going to be 2.1 and so these are all you have to what you're trying to do is to add value for your client you want to make sure there's no ambiguity and so that is where I was talking to you all about up there in the introductory provisions I have this I will come down in my definitions and define in this agreement David Dennison uh, me wherever uh, you see David Dennison David Dennison shall mean E E E C L L C and or David Dennis. There were some places in the agreement where it just talked about D D. I want to make it clear so that you know, because there were you know people who were talking about, well, he's a party to the agreement. Blah blah blah. blah. Okay, and then uh, and we'll talk later. But you can see how here you have your. It talks about your Exhibit A. And what I always try to tell people is when you have a side chick, you might need a side letter. So you think to yourself, you got a side chick, you might find yourself needing a side letter agreement. <laughs> so, <laughs> but for me, if I'm going to do an agreement, I'm just going to put it on, I'm just going to put it in there. I don't need a side, I don't need to put a private side letter. I don't need a side letter and a side chick. <laughs> you, they want to go and tiptoe down in the exhibit A and put all the, but when you read Exhibit A, it doesn't say anything. So that is where you'll see the problem came in in this agreement. Loosey goosey, just loosey goosey. They were too scared to say it in the agreement, what it was. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that if they had, what do you think they would have made it, like what do you think they could have changed to make him completely identified by the agreement? 
Okay, well then, first of all, and we're going to get to it, but an identification agreement would have been good. That they didn't have an identification clause in the WGO, and we'll, we'll get to that part. They had a whole lot of other good things, but so because, and, and I'll talk to you about the identification, but it was not clear what she was supposed to not say. It was just like there was confidential information. Didn't say what day the confidential information came from. I mean, if it could have even said regarding, you know, a, a, a private relationship. Uh, I, I would have went ahead and said a sexual relationship. I would have had to say it because you got to say it. Occurring on or about so and so, such such date and such such time. I would have to identify because, see, that's where, because at some point, I'm saying to myself, well, surely, 60 Minutes does not want a lawsuit. Surely, CBS is not going to let her come on there. Come to find out, when you read the agreement, <laughs> it doesn't say, it really, that's where the problem is going, because it really didn't say what she's supposed to not say. Standards. That's a standards issue. So, um, so what I'm doing now is I am just coming in now and I'm just talking to you. I'm doing dual roles now because I'm touching on some of the things we've talked about in some of the chapters we've read over the past week, declarations. And I'm going to go ahead and place them in the sections as we go along. And so our book talks about declarations, and really, they're, to me, they're just they're definitions, declarations about you know certain things. And so what you do is you put them in the definitions, and then our book says, and then you need to take a definition throughout that agreement and kick it into action. You'll define who, what, and then you'll say later on. You'll kick it in action and say what, who, and what are supposed to do. The representations that you hereby represent by entering into this agreement. I know who it is, I'm, and I know what it is that they're so. Not, so then, so these are up in the declarations. <clears throat> and so our book is you know, examples of these. Declarations, definitions. Purchase price means, and then you're going to take that definition and kick it in action. The buyer shall pay the purchase price. We know what it is now. Later on, in some declaration uh, or condition representation or whatever it may be, we're going to kick it in action by saying, Okay, the buyer shall pay the purchase price. I know what that purchase price is now. Back in my declaration, it tells me. And then now, we get to this section three. This is like where we're starting to really get the guts of the agreement now. The business slash actions section. And as you'll see, the, the, they are kind of separate. You have your actions sections, and then you have your business. We're going to talk about the actions, which are the most important. And they're, well, I shouldn't say the most important, but they're critical. Then we're going to get into the substantive business sections. They refer to the main business provisions of the contract. They're gonna, you're going to see the rights and the obligations. It, the, here is where you're going to see the money or other value that's going to be exchanged. The term of the agreement. When we say the term, the length, the time period. Did you two go out for dinner that night? No. You had dinner in the room? Yes. What happened next? I asked him if I could use his restroom, and he said yes. You know, it's through the you know through the bedroom. You'll see it. So I I excused myself and I went to the the restroom. You know, I was in there for a little bit and came out, and he was.
sitting, you know, on the edge of the bed when I walked out, perched. And when you saw that, what went through your mind? Uh, I realized exactly what I'd gotten myself into. And I was like, ugh, here we go. <laughs> and I just felt like maybe uh, it was sort of, I had it coming for making a bad decision for going into someone's room alone. And I just heard the voice and I, well, you put yourself in a bad situation and bad things happen. So you deserve this. And you had sex with him? Yeah. You were 27, he was 60. Were you physically attracted to him? No. Not at all? No. Did you want to have sex with him? No. But I didn't, I didn't say no. I'm not a victim. I'm not. It was entirely consent. Oh, yes. The whole, uh, that's the crux of the agreement. And that's how I feel now. Everything she just said, none of that's in this agreement. I, and really, it was just a little snippet. Because all I need is the little piece right there where, you know, she cops, you know, she says what they did. That's the part that we don't want to get out. As much as it may pain somebody to write that down, you gotta put, you gotta find a way. Yes, ma'am. A question. So, if so, was she paid after, like the whole scandal, or was she paid for the sex? I guess I could ask that later. Okay. <laughs> I just really uh, curious. It never really got done, and I don't think anybody it will admit to whether or not. But I. I think he probably paid her. Yeah. But she's, yeah. yeah. She's not going to admit it, though. Okay. But that's really uh, a, not an issue for here because okay. at this point now, what we have is, you know, it's starting to get back to them that she's going to talk about it. And so to quelch it, that's where this agreement comes into play, to try to... Uh, enter into an agreement to keep this issue confidential. Now, I'm sure he paid her a couple, you know, I'm sure he paid her. Because if you look at all of the, because the, the other woman, you know, that was his custom, was to just offer him a little something, a little, you know. And so I'm sure, I'm sure he did. We never did get to that issue. Nobody answered Cooper. I don't know why he didn't ask her that. <laughs> <laughs> Should have asked her, but he didn't ask her. Anyway, yes, ma'am. So the crux of why she's able to talk about it, even though they signed a non-disclosure agreement, is because it was vague. Okay. Now let me just say this: we're still getting to the issue of whether she could talk about it. I oh, am okay. saying, and I'm saying, in the meantime, because this is still in litigation, I okay. I am saying yes because she had. There was the 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 risk was not controlled enough for her to. You'll see, you'll think it's controlled enough because it's a million dollars per violation, but she thinks she has a little bit of wiggle room right there. See, because it is not necessarily obviously there's some wiggle room because if I'm CBS's attorney, I'm saying to this, don't touch it with a ten foot pole. But there's a little bit of wiggle room there for everybody to weigh the benefit, the benefit for CBS, because they, you know, it blew up. You know, everybody was watching to see what she was going to say. And it doesn't, there's enough, there's, it, there's a gap there. It just, it's like confidential information won't, won't come out. Section three, <laughs> action section. Okay. And this is just how I would do it. But see me, I would just get my little ribbon out and I would just start sketching out. I put my, you know, I put my little title on it. I put my uh, section one, my uh, introductory provisions, and I go down to my definitions. You know, I start, you know, dropping a few pieces in there, and then I'm gonna come to my section three, just to get myself started. I'm gonna go into my action. We got our business slash action sections. You wanna do your actions first, okay? Our first provision with our book calls that subject matter performance provision. It is a covenant. That magic word that we talked about earlier. 
So it kind of gets you going. Okay, so when people start saying, okay, where do I put this? Where do I put that? Okay, here, here you go. Get your little covenant. Your subject matter performance provision. The seller promises to sell and the buyer promises to buy. David Dennison promises to give you this money. Peggy Peterson promises not to talk about the sexual event that occurred on such such day. You know, the action, the, the, the subject matter performance. This is the, I mean, this is the cat's meow right here. We want to put that right there. What, what we're agreeing to. All right, another example. Uh, in a publishing agreement where the main subject matter of the contract is the publication of a book, the author promises to write the book, and the publisher promises to publish it. Here's our action section, our first provision. It's going to be our subject matter performance provision. Now, it can be, um, as I stated before, uh, it can be like a reciprocal covenant. Or it may not necessarily be uh, a reciprocal covenant. One party promising to do something, another par a par party promising to do another thing. It could be just by signing this agreement on the one side. In other words, the words are the performance. But in any respect, you're going to need to have that first provision, your subject matter performance provision. <clears throat> in your book, it gives you a little example of your reciprocal promises or your executory promises or your self-executing provisions. By signing the security agreement, the borrower grants the lender a security interest in the assets. Then now, we're still in our section three. We're talking about, first we're going to talk about our action section. The first provision being that subject matter performance provision. Then we're going to come into our payment provision. Word, and the word shall creates a covenant. For example, the seller shall sell the car to the buyer. The word may creates a right. For example, the seller may continue to drive the car for up to 500 additional miles until the keys are delivered to the buyer. This gives them a right. That's very uh, familiar. Something like that is something very similar. Some of you probably haven't even read that <laughs> that transaction one yet, but it's kind of there might have been something similar there. Actions can be required or prohibited, and the standards of liability can be created to allocate risk in your payment provision. And we're going to do something now. If I were you, let's just do, you know, for our first, let's just, you know, we're going to deal with some more complex scenarios down the road where you may need to break this up into several different sections, but. Let's just write something clear out for our first extravaganza, and then we can move into more complex uh, scenarios. And so the payment provisions, the monetary provisions, they have two components, a statement of the amount 
and then a promise to pay. So the provisions can be drafted as a covenant. So there's going to be two ways to do it. You can either draft it as a covenant or you can draft it as a declaration and covenant combo. The statement of the amount would be a declaration and the covenant to pay or the covenant to pay the stated, the stated amount. The buyer promises to pay the seller $150,000 for Black Acre at the closing. Y'all talk about Black Acre a lot in Hershey. Well, I had a professor, he used to call me Black Acre. I mean, he would come, you know, he would call a roll and he'd be like, Black Acre. And I'm like, hey. <laughs> 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 He would call me Black Acre. <laughs> Uh, and so here I am using Black Acre. Okay. Uh, or you can do a declaration and covenant. The purchase price for Black Acre is $150,000. This is the purchase price. You know, you have your two uh, provisions here. And the buyer shall pay the seller the purchase price at closing. So, um, you know how, uh, because it, you know, it, for the most part, declaration is, you know, it's, it's, it's a definition in some respects. And so you know how you were saying earlier, if you could have definitions, you will see there will sometimes be a definition in a section. It may be a definition and a representation, or it could be a definition, a representation, a covenant, I mean, all in one section. Because these are concepts that are in our sections. There's no, there's no necessity to have all of your representations in one spot. You will see that we do have a section for representations and warranties which we will, but there is no reason why other sections of your agreement could not have representations as well. And then our book talks about other action sections. Some agreements have other action sec uh, sections. It's just going to depend on the different types of agreements. Here are some other action sections. The term, the closing date, closing deliveries. These also go in that action section. Me personally, I would put that, I would put all my little action sections at the beginning of the business slash actions section, section three. And so we talk about term, which is the duration of the agreement. These provisions can be either drafted as a part of a subject matter performance provision. You saw how we did that. So they're part of a covenant or as a declaration. Concepts. Got our sections. This is how we're using our concepts. Example as a part of the such matter performance provision, the landlord shall rent the premises to the tenant, and the tenant shall rent the premises from the landlord for a period of three years, beginning on such such date. So you see, somebody is reading this and they're saying they wrote this, and they said, "Oh, you know what? Huh. This could create a could this create this this could could this create what kind of issue could this create?" Because I just want to get us in that. Yes, ma'am. It could create a standards issue. Because you got to look at this. You're like, okay, do I need to? I, I don't want there to be any. That a word. That's right. And so I need to say, okay, uh, for a period of three years from what day? From the beginning of uh, 
three for a period of three years beginning on January the first until exact day and ending on this day. Yeah, that. Great. Okay. Sometimes you may write it out and then you have to come back and you need to look at it and say, okay, does this create a money issue, standards issue, risk, control, end game? You want to add value to it. Write it. Then you want to add value. Okay? Or as a declaration, the term of the lease is three years beginning on January 1st, blah, 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 ending on December 31st. 20, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you have it as, you could do it as a declaration, you could do it as a, you know, a combo. I probably, me personally, I like a combo. I like to just make sure it's all. Closing date is also going to go in your action section. And now, so all contracts don't have a closing, okay? But if there is a closing date, some type of period between which the parties are, you know, they say, okay, yeah, we, you know, it's like a, handshake type of a thing. Yeah, I'm interested. I, okay, my attorney will get back to your attorney. We'll, you know, we'll close on. That way, I'll exchange the property with you and you will pay for it on the closing date. And so here we have closing date. And agreements that do not have closing dates, uh, the performance begins immediately on the signing. Unless it is postponed until one or more conditions are satisfied. So we're starting to talk, you know, more about, some people had questions about conditions, you know, they're closing deliveries. Okay, so these are the documents, you know, there may be a title, you know, there are what the keys, you know, whatever it is that needs to be exchanged at the closing. The, the warranty, the records that go with it, whatever it is. And so, this could create what kind of issue here? Yes, ma'am. Um, the risk? The risk issue? Uh, it, it could. What else? So standards? Standards. Because you want to put it, you want to make sure, because whoever it is, it, like you said, risk, okay? If it may be a risk for you as the buyer, okay? I don't want to say you want to control it with the standards issue, but you do. <laughs> it's a standards issue as well. I mean, you want to define what it is. Don't just say, bring the closing documents. Because then you might need the title. Don't you want the title? Yes. And so you want to be sure that you put that in there. And so here again, you see this is uh, the... I'm just showing you that example, how they have that action section. So, we have talked about something. so here is our Stormy Daniels. lawsuit. This is where I got it from, you know, because they filed a lawsuit and then uh, uh, Donald Dennison, <laughs> David Dennison, removed it to federal court because of the arbitration agreement. I used to do this to people all the time. <laughs> and so, uh, there it is. It's right there. The notice of removal, they moved the case. And so, of course, in her State court pleadings. This is her state court pleading. She filed it right down there. Stanley, Stanley Moss Court 
Angeles house in Los Angeles. And she attached a copy of the agreement. And so here, this is kind of in, in her agreement where she kind of has her action sections. And you see, so she got, she, I mean, she got her $130,000 wired straight to her bank account, her attorney's trust account. He took out his, his portion, gave her hers. I'm sorry, uh, Donald Trump. I'm sorry, boo, but you're going to have to cover more than $100,000 for me to keep my mouth shut. I, I don't Because, <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> okay, so anyway, so here it is. It kind of, you know, but it, look at this. Do you say, do you see anywhere where it says PP shall keep her mouth closed? And she is all about assigning and turning over the DVD and the whatever, who, what. And it never says that she's supposed to keep her mouth closed. It's not, it's, I'm sorry. Okay. So, so that's what I wanted to show you there, the action uh, section here. It's devoid of any, uh, you know, talk about the actual subject matter. Uh, and so you know what, I may stop. This will be a good place. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit further into this and then we'll... So you'll see that we've talked about our actions. This is our, you know, business slash action section. So I broke it out and I showed you your actions. Now we're going to talk about our business sections, which can be any it can include any of our seven concepts. This is now when we're getting into the guts, the meaty part of the agreement. And this is where now you will start to bring in your, uh, your other concepts. <clears throat> but they will go in these remaining provisions. They will go into the, these remaining sections uh, or provisions. But it will be, so you'll see how we'll go forward uh, throughout here. But throughout this course, we're going to talk in depth more about these concepts. So, uh, but just so that we can have enough information to get our first project done. So then we're going into our business sections, our business slash action section. Um, and so, as I stated here, we're in this particular section, we're going to fold in some ideas from our uh, contract concepts. And so, you want to think about the client's goals here. Now, this is where we're going to try to establish the idea of adding value to the deal now. And so, you can see here, I I'm just going to bring in the discussion that we're having in our sections, our chapters that we're talking about. So I'm bringing them in here where they go in our business sections. We're going to talk about covenants and how our book is telling us that a covenant is a promise, a promise to perform. And so it can be a promise to do something or to refrain from doing something. And in doing so, this covenant is going to establish a duty or an obligation. And so here is where you have the obligation on the one hand that is going to be stated in that covenant. A person shall do some certain thing. And then on the other hand, which will establish a right. Or the other party, if Sam is obligated to perform in favor of Keisha, then Keisha is going to have a right to, to receive that performance. And so if the landlord shall keep the ten, tenant's premises, then the tenant is going to in turn have a right to have that premises heated. Covenants and rights. In our business sections now, and we already talked about that subject matter performance covenant. 
covenant, which is going to establish that obligation, which will then, in turn, provide a right on the other hand. And we talk, we'll talk more about these as we go on, but remember I was telling you how, one, you have your covenants and your rights. You have your representations and your warranties. They kind of go hand in hand. Okay? And so now we're going to talk about conditions. Our seven, build, uh, seven uh, contract concept condition. But keep in mind, there is also a section in a formal agreement that is a condition to closing. That's not what we're talking about here. Okay, let's not get that confused. Conditions as a building block are covenants. So they can be anywhere throughout that agreement. Let's not get that confused with the section conditions to closing. And so our conditions, if, or in other words, on the condition that, somebody saying if, on the condition that the retailer notifies the manufacturer that it requires additional merchandise, then the manufacturer shall ship the additional merchandise to the retailer no later than three business days. A condition. I have to be notified. On condition that you notify, or, and so this then can create what? What kind of issue here? I keep talking about the same one. It's the same one. Standards. Standards. <laughs> so you want to make sure that it is defined correctly so that the condition can be met. We'll get more into all this, but this is what you need to know is the conditions are a part of the business section. Our book talks to us about the interplay. You have your representation, your warranty, <coughs> your covenants, shall. When you say that word shall, you're going to know that is a covenant. It's an obligation now at that point. I may have an obligation, but in some respect, there may need to be a condition to kick in. On the condition that, however, that you do such, 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 then so-and-so shall. So it's like, you know, it is going to be determined based on the goals of the client. Discretionary authority. And so in that, it's discretionary, it's a choice. You'll see words like may, the borrower shall invest into any person, except the borrower may invest in any way, hold in, uh, the borrower shall not invest in any person, except the borrower may invest in any wholly owned subsidiary of the borrower. Because the borrower owns that. So we'll get, you know, more into these concepts. So that's your business sections. This is our uh, agreement. Uh, not example agreement. So you'll see your covenants. And I showed you how we... You know, you write it out, and then you look at it, you stand back, and you ask yourself, is there any business issue of client concern that I need to address? And so then now we're going to move into our fourth section that is talked about in our formal agreement, the representations and warranties. So I personally, I would just, me, I would just do it. Step by step. One, introductory, definitions. Then I'll go three. I'll bring in my actions, make sure they're set out correctly. 
Then I bring in my business, all of the other seven, whatever. There could be some representations and warranties even in those. Now, let's keep that in mind. And then now we'll have a section here that contains your separate and apart representations and warranties. And now this is uh, very important uh, because, and, and, and so usually when we're dealing with our representations, these are representations that are going to be made at the time that the parties are entering into that agreement. So I'm going to go back here. So that I can stress that. This section contains the premises on which the deal is based at the time of signing. Okay? So you can have a covenant, a promise to do something in the future, but now our representations, I represent and warrant that the tires on the car are brand new. I just bought the tires last week. Other possible representations and warranties include the car only has a certain number of miles on it. It was maintained properly. Now, if I were to say that, what would that create? Standard a standard issue. That could be fine for some people, but some other people need to define what properly means. I change the oil every 3,000 miles, whatever it could be. So in this scenario, would it be better to define properly in the definition section or just give more details in the representation? You can, it's up to you. Uh, here, you could definitely define it right here. Properly shall mean, and then do be careful that a promise to do something in the future is not a representation. Okay. So that's going to be your defining marker here. These are things that are representations that are made as of the time of entering into the agreement. But what could it be? A covenant. So now you see how, you know, how it all clicks together now. You see? The, the, the concepts and the sections and the issues of concern. So we're putting it all together. And so you want to have both in your agreement. Okay. The, the, the reason that you want to have the warranty in there is because in the event, there can be some instance where a person makes a representation and it turns out that they did not know there is some negligent representation of a certain fact. And so then there's no sign to her in that particular instance, and so then you cannot get them for fraud, so to speak. And so for the warranty, you don't necessarily need that reliance component, so you want to have both in there. Seller's representation of the warrant. The seller represents and warrants as follows. And in the uh, instance that uh, that there was no uh, material misrepresentation, then you still have a warranty to fall back. And then we're going to talk about our conditions of closing. Okay, so this, I, you know, you it kind of makes it seem like, oh, you mean like the closing. It's just the conditions to, this is like our checklist to check and make sure that the uh, representations, covenants, obligations, whatever, 
are all established, and this is what this section uh, is for. This section lists the requirements to close the deal, not necessarily what we're talking about closing, but typically they are the representations and warranties were true when made. It's like the cleanup section. And the representations and warranties were true as of the closing that the parties have fulfilled their obligations and covenants that are required. Conditions to closing section. Okay, let's not get this confused with conditions, the concept, the building block concept. This is the section of a formal agreement. And you can see here how it is in our uh, example. And even in your conditions of closing, you want to be sure that you have established whether or not there are any issues of concern that need to be cleaned up in here. Then now we're moving on to our termination section. And this section concerns the circumstances with the parties may have to terminate the agreement. The procedure for doing that. The effective date, if any. <coughs> Then your remedies and indemnifications and indemnities, indemnification. Um, and then I'm going to go back to your question that you asked earlier, maybe not right at this minute, but uh, this is very important because this is a section where you can definitely drill down on risk and control issues. And so here, this is a very important part of that uh, Stormy Daniels agreement because a lot of what you would think <laughs> would stop her from talking would be here in this part of the agreement. The remedies for breach. That's states right here that it's going to be a million dollars per violation. So it states it right there resulting from each breach. And so that is uh, so, so what she did was uh, nobody had even sued her yet. She sued so that she could get out of the agreement. She wanted to go into court to so that the, the agreement could be determined not valid. And so that's really how they got into court. Because at this point now, she is on her Make America Great Again tour. She's going all around to the different strip clubs, and she's making money now. Not seeing back then when she entered into this $130,000 agreement to keep quiet, she just takes $130,000 to keep quiet, then her career takes off. Everybody, all the strip clubs, they want her now to come around, and she's on a Make America Great Again tour, so she wants to now talk about it, 
So now she wants to get, she really just wants to get out of your group. That's really what this is all about. Okay. And so the agreement has, however, a uh, a um, arbitration agreement in it. And so here's the arbitration agreement. Well, for me, this is not enough. There is no defense, what we call a defense and indemnification agreement. Because for me, I would say, yes, Stormy Daniels, it'll be a million dollars per violation, and then you will defend and identify me from any suits that are brought. You're going to pay my attorney's fees if there's any suit or any, so she brings suit, then yeah, go ahead. Any litigation, because there's an arbitration agreement here. So she is violating the agreement in all different kinds of ways. The million dollars isn't enough. The million dollars wasn't enough because they didn't put a good subject matter performance provision in there. So that's a standards issue. When you write your subject matter performance provision, I'm going to be looking to see to make sure that you, you know, I want you to establish that. Set it out so that you want to stand back and look at it. Do you need to give us like a sentence again while we're I'm going to say EC, LLC, and or David Dennison will pay $130,000 and Stormy Daniels and or PP will refrain from or in exchange for Stormy Daniels promise to refrain from in any way, shape or form, <laughs> form or fashion, disclosing the events of any sexual relationship between Stormy Daniels and or PP on the one hand, and EC, LLC, and or David Dennison on the other hand. So, I mean, you don't, I, I will start out there. Then you can come back and look at it and say, okay, let me clean it up. Does it establish any, is there a, a standards issue? My point in that is to make sure that the action, the basis of the promise that the parties came together for is clearly stated. Because it, that's where we had our risk issue or control standards, whatever you want to call it, because there was a wiggle room there where she could go in and talk about because it wasn't defined. And then I'm going to, you know, set the remedies. And you would think that the remedies are high enough here for her not to go and talk about it, but. And so when you go and you go out there and you get on, uh, what do you call it when you do the crowdfunding? Uh, GoFundMe. Uh, go <laughs> just go, just do two. Go do one for your attorney and you do one for me. <laughs> <laughs> two GoFundMe accounts. Stormy. So, all right. So y'all can move. So, so now I'm hoping that I'm giving you the idea, you know, of how. We do this. I mean, so you go through each section, you know, make sure you have your sections that you need. And then once you get into your sections, you want to make sure that you uh, 
or have the, you know, the concepts, the contract concepts that you need. The way that we do that is where, you know, you write it out, then you stand back and look at it. You want to add value to the deal. You want to go through your step. Does this create a standards issue? Oh, do I need to define this a little bit more? We got the, the name. We don't we need to define the uh, contract amount or, you know, the term or, you know. And you can see, I'm going to go back. Um, a standards issue in this arbitration agreement. See how they clearly laid out where it's going to be in this state. Who is going to, you know, be before if it's in this state. This is a standards issue here for some reason. California, Nevada, Arizona. So, you know, you write it out, then you want to go back and look at it. Look and see if there are any standards issues that may be arising. Then your general provisions now. Okay, you know, your choice of law. If there is a lawsuit, it will take place in the state of California. Waiver of jury trial. Any notice of breach or whatever, it, notice of whatever. So see, this is our general provision. So in each section, you want to look at your uh, concepts and whatever business issues of concern there may be. And so this is what it looks like in the Stormy Day. And then our signatures. And so our book is telling us that, yes, we want to make sure that the parties both sign the agreement. That's great. Okay. And, and we definitely want to make sure that for our <laughs> agreement that we have a good signature line for the parties uh, to sign. Somebody asked uh, ECLLC. So that means that the attorney would sign for ECLLC. It's not going to necessarily be Donald Trump. The fact of the matter is, Donald Trump did not know what was going on. He really did. I mean, the people, you know, uh, Cohen talked about him. There's a tape where he talked, but he still didn't. He didn't. You could tell he did not know what the heck was going on. <laughs> and, and, and everybody's trying to say that he said to pay her by check and you could tell, he asked, uh, when Cohen said, we got a pair, he was like, what? Pair? <laughs> He's just completely clueless. So it's really, <laughs> and so here are your signatures. There is no signature for David Dennison. And so I'm going to go briefly here. And, and I may have to cut it off. One thing I've never understood is, you know, there's a signature line on the contract for the, you know, DD, which is Donald Trump's pseudonym. Why didn't he sign? Okay, so the bottom line is you have a contract between ECLLC and Stormy Daniels. So at the time when this was all going on, he could, he, you know, there, there may have been a situation where Michael could have brought it to him to sign. Michael chose to just allow ECLC to be the party. That's why we have the and or. And by the way, I, I know you've made up your own laws wait, in this wait, case. But wait, wait, let me just get to this. And or, by the way, has the same meaning in New York as it does in Wyoming, as it does in California. Okay. Because you're trying to school me on the California law, I actually researched, and guess what? The United States Supreme Court and cases in California all agree but, but that and or is there's either there's or. There's, 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 another, there's another provision in the contract, I believe it's section 8.6, which says not, if the contract is not valid unless everybody signs. Doesn't that trump the at or? It, it, it's not valid unless the parties sign. The parties to the contract 
are are ECLC and Stormy Daniels. And certainly, so why, certainly is there, why is there a line that says DD for Donald Trump? Because, Trump? because, it, because it for gave, no reason. It, yes, it gave the option yes. for Donald Trump to be a party to the contract. But, but could, instead, but he's not he, a party. He's a third party beneficiary. But, but wait, but could he have, in terms of that third party beneficiary, they, couldn't there have just been a contract between Stormy Daniels and uh, e, and the and the limited liability corporation that benefited? Uh, Mr. Trump, and right. that's exactly what they said. So why have a, why have a third line there at all? Because it gave it gave the option. Why did they for, need that? Option? Because Michael wanted to have the option. That's why he purposely did it. This was a carefully drafted contract. With. <laughs> okay. I'm going to move on from that, but you can see how this whole issue of the signature. If somebody's not going to sign it, don't don't put a line there for them. Uh, the fact of the matter is that once the consideration, the problem that Stormy Daniels is going to have is she took the money. If she didn't want to enter into the agreement, she should not have taken the money. So that is where all of your contracts classes where you have the equity comes in and all these different kinds of things. But the fact of the matter is none of this can play out in court because of the arbitration agreement. Yes, ma'am. Can you make an unconscionability argument, like when you have a $130,000 payment versus like a million dollar every time you talk? Like, no, because she signed it. But I mean, isn't with unconscionability, I mean, I'm not saying this is, I'm just curious. Like, it, with unconscionability. Not really, because she shouldn't have signed it. Even if you have unequal bargaining power? No, she shouldn't have signed it. Okay. Uh, she could read that, and it says, all I'm giving is $130,000. Mm -hmm. Every time I, so it's really was meant for her that somebody would think she would never talk about it. And I didn't either until I started to read the agreement. So it's not unconscionable. Mm -hmm. it, it was meant, it, the, 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 the importance of the confidentiality was that high for that party. It was a benefit of the bargain. It don't, she didn't have to sign it. So, no, that's not going to fly. If for some reason um, Stormy had been an employee of the Trump Foundation or something, would they then have a, you know, like a duty to inform her of any potential uncomfortability or... No, no, no. Yes, ma'am. Okay, what about her story with the... Um, someone coming up to their car and saying what so she said. So they still haven't found that person. Okay. They put the they put the sketch of the they put the sketch of him out there or they posted that out there. Nobody has come forward to say they know who that person is. Somebody comes up to my car <laughs> and my me and my baby getting out and they talking about nice baby. I'm if they let me get out of there alive, the next stop. I'm not going inside the gym. <laughs> gym I'm going to the police department. Period. So this is all crazy. I mean, the whole thing is just crazy. Right. Nobody has ever been able to establish who that person was. Then, okay, so we talked about our signatures and then the exhibits, you know, like if you need a side agreement. <laughs> <laughs> then you go ahead and you put that in your exhibits, do whatever, and you attach that. And see here we have our side agreement, our side letter agreement. It still does not say a word about the alleged incident. 